And our next speaker is uh, Jean-Francois Lamarck from NCAR, who will be talking about model, modeling the couplings across the Earth's surface in CES and the community Earth surface. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, Enrique did a great job at introducing uh, some of the aspects of the climate model, or system model, that, um, that we're developing at NCAR and throughout the, the community. So, so I, was, I was in, in the same boat as Enrique and but knowing what the audience were, was. And so, so I put something that, that might be a little too general, but hopefully we'll, we'll just generate um, in a pause so that people might, might get back to me. Unfortunately, I will have to run right after the, this meeting, but, but please contact me. Uh, you can find my email and have a pretty easy name to find on the web. Okay, so CSM. Uh, so CSM stands for the uh, Community Earth System Model. And so, so the, the way it works is, is that um, just even though we, we have a, a really large group at NCAR working on this model, this model can only be made and work and work well because there's a very large community of people outside NCAR that is developing, using, testing, writing papers, all sorts of ways we can actually make this thing work. And what is this thing? So, um, a slightly different version of, of the one Enrique uh, showed. Um, so, so, we have basically five main boxes. One is, is the atmosphere, land, sea ice, ocean. We now have a land ice representation, representation of, of glaciers um, in, um, in the model. All is being talked to each other through a coupler. Um, and in, in addition to those big boxes, we, we have some variations within those, like we have some versions of the atmosphere where there is interactive chemistry, uh, tropospheric aerosols, um, ozone. We also have a very high top, which we call the uh, whole atmosphere, which extends right now to 150 kilometers for the people who are interested in the atmosphere. I don't think there's too many in this room. But, um, and then above, because now we're, we're starting to develop about space weather. How uh, um, perturbations of um, the US solar variability, how that's influencing the upper atmosphere. Very important for people who, who have satellites up there. And then um, some, some other thing that um, Enrique uh, talked about, the biogeochemistry. So um, having the representations of the biology both in the ocean and on the land. And I will be discussing today um, one of the reasons being that uh, knowing that Enrique is going to talk about the ocean, uh, most of my talk will be about land, but it can be applicable just, just the overall structure to um, different different species. So we, we have this big system that we can um, make work with all those being coupled or some of them being coupled. So there is a lot of flexibility because we, we want to try to understand how the system works, right? You don't want to just have your most complicated system all the time. You want to be able to cut things out. So try, try to start cutting those couplings and feedbacks that were discussed before to see how important they are. And, and so this, this system, when we start running for long climate simulations, um, the type of, of IPCC uh, that are being used in IPCC reports and, and numerous papers, is, is through a certain number of courses. And those courses are fairly limited in um, their um, what is, what is being driven. So, so, for example, we might specify uh, greenhouse gases, some, some of the longer greenhouse gases, emissions, uh, aerosols, volcanic eruptions, we don't do. There's no volcanoes in this. Uh, so, variability, land use change, so the kind of things that, that we don't have internally done. But then, what we try to do is to have everything else being explicitly represented in the model and all its interactions. And Enrique did a wonderful job at talking about how important those interactions are. 
So just, just a, a very brief. Uh, so this is this is the way we we actually get things done. We have working groups which tend to focus on specific aspects. Like we have a group on on atmosphere model. And if you want to know how it's how the uh, the convection is being done, then this is the group uh, that will be discussing this and where to go next. And then all those groups try to uh, we have weekly meetings or bi-weekly meetings now, um, trying to to work together on on moving forward getting the, the best model that okay. we can. But we also have similar to, to this, um, but slightly uh, bigger in, in size. Two annual meetings. We had one in February, and then we will have one um, in, in Breckenridge. Uh, we make sure we go to the, to the mountains. Um, so we, we, and then we have about 400 people. And for a few days, this, this is where we, we cram and get people to talk to each other, get the coupling, build the coupling mechanism to get all those people to put together, because this is a lot of expertise. People, if people are interested, uh, this is the uh, most current version of, of the description paper to what is the uh, community versus the model, what are, what are the, the boxes. And then when all, all is done, and, and we're, we're using this model. We're generating, generating thousands of years of simulations. Um, for example, this is the um, climate modeling comparison project phase five. So this is this is usually done in support of IPCC. And so this is a model into comparison. And this is where we try to see where, where we fit. And, and of course, I take this figure because we're, it's putting our models at the top. Not, not all of them are that good. But, but, but the model is, is doing pretty good. And I think this is a representation of the fact that we have a lot of people from a lot of places and a lot of different expertise using and testing the model. This is not just a small group of people. So right now, um, the standard configuration, similar to what um, Enrique has been discussing, uh, the first version of the community or system model, tends to have atmosphere um, resolution quarter of a degree, one degree, two degrees. Our workhorse is the one degree. This is something that when we run on the Intel computer, we can get about 20 years a day. Which is, which is pretty good because we're going to be doing thousands of years. Um, and we do that with a 30 minute time step, uh, 32 levels going up from the, the, uh, the 6 to 40 kilometers, 72 if we go to 150 kilometers. The ocean has um, two standard configurations, 10th of a degree and one degree. Oceanographers, the part two, and then the oceanographer. But they say we don't, we don't want to do anything in between. So either we're either resolving or we're not. And so, so there's no configuration that we're really uh, using routinely, at least. And then uh, ground layers. So at one degree, it's about five million grid boxes. So this is and one and a half million lines of code. So this is a big, big effort. Really difficult, really tricky to keep track of that. But at the same time, we're trying to give that to people. And you can actually run this model on your laptop. But you're not going to run it at a quarter of a degree, or you might run it four times that. But, but you, you can actually run it at, at 10 degrees resolution, really, really coarse, and just the atmosphere, not the ocean. But, but you can still learn a lot, and that's one thing that we really try hard, is to make it usable by a large group of, of people. And uh, you'll still have to compile one and a half million lines of it, or a good chunk of it. But then we try to, to, to generate data so that people can use, because the model is not, is only going to be as good as what you can make uh, the, the science with it. Lots of data, and it's, it's used real literally by hundreds of people around the world. And we'll, we'll have a CSM2 released at the end of the year, and so we're working really hard right now on getting this going. So, um, in developing a model such as CSM, we, we when the, the three main aspects that we, we have to deal with for unfortunately limited resources. We only have the computer as big as, as we have. 
we can we have to balance complexity on some of size and resolution. And, and then we'll spend a little bit of time discussing ensemble size. Enrique uh, talked about it a little bit, but I, I will make that, that point. Um, and then, and then this, is, this is the the complexity, the amount of processes um, that has been um, included into the, the model. And the way um, people have, have complained about the fact that climate models um, from the previous IPCC report, or the previous one, they really didn't give you any different climate simulations. And, and to me, it's like, wow, this is amazing that we actually get something that looks like the previous one. Because in the meantime, we've introduced so many processes that we know are occurring in the real world. We're trying to represent it. The chances of things just exploding were extremely high. And yet, we were able to get something. So it's, it's like, okay, so we're doing it, we're introducing processes but we're introducing, introducing them with enough information on the observations that we actually are learning something. We are representing more of a system and less of just putting things so that it works. And so, so we have a continuous push towards uh, complexity. And then this, this is kind of a standard IPCC. I, I could actually make this a, even more complicated. But, but this is kind of where we are, having, having all sorts of pieces are being, being added. The importance of internal variability and the necessity for ensemble is, is critical. And it's critical in actually defining what the model should be. So this, is, this is something that, that was done at NCAR and with uh, help from people from uh, Toronto. We, we did um, a very long control run. So this, so this is something that's um, 1850 conditions. Nothing, nothing changes. And soil constant is the same. Conditions are the same. Nothing changes. And then we let the model go and just compute its own thing for everything else. And so as you these wiggles, they're small for so for global surface temperature, they're small. But they're, they're not zero, right? They're wiggles, it's and so, and so it's showing up here, all sorts of things. But then regionally, it's going to be a lot more there. But so after we have, we actually, this is an old flag, we actually have now 2,000 years. And then we started one ensemble member, 1815, 1920. In 1920, we just um, stopped. And so it's uh, 40 different ensemble numbers, all defined by 10 to the minus 14 in one level of the atmosphere. 10 to the minus 14 Kelvin. So it's, it's a big butterfly, but it's a butterfly. Right? And then you let the model go. So no areas are, are showing up. And so this is the ensemble mean. So all those wiggles, all those gray lines are different on some of the members. Because this is a forest, forest system, most of it will kind of look the same. But what happens when you start looking at here the trends over a 30 odd years um, of the wintertime surface temperature? Right, so this is this is this is not a very high. We're not looking at extremes or anything here, right? This is this is just a linear trend over 30 years of the surface temperature, and these are different ensemble members. And I'm only putting ten. Uh, and this is how different each of those can be for that very simple. Calculation. And this is the ensemble mean. So if you put all, all of them together, these are the observations. So the ensemble mean doesn't look like the observations. And lots of blue here, no, none of the blues here. But some of the ensemble members are showing. So you can start trying to dissect so what is going on, what is, what is this one different than this one. And maybe try to understand why the OBS, which in a way is a single realization of the world, and if the model was perfect, this would be just 30 realizations of the, of the real world. But then you can start understanding how the system works and why it's leading to the differences that you're seeing.
in the meantime, when you're trying to answer what is the trend over the three years is computed by the model, then we can just say, we can just run the model once and say this is this number. Because if we run it and change one digit in the temperature 60 years before that calculation, we'll get this. So which one is right? Is it this one or this one? So we have, so this is, this is extremely limiting what we can do because this is the only way you can actually give an answer. So I'm going to spend some time just trying to, to discuss this in the context of trying to model the carbon cycle in the Earth system. So again, going beyond just the standard climate temperatures um, and precipitation, this is trying to do an Earth system and looking at the biology. So what is what is the carbon cycle? Well, and there, is, there is a little bit in the atmosphere. There's a lot in uh, reservoirs, whether they're in the ocean, they're in the soils. All sorts of fluxes going up and down. And with actually very, very small net fluxes, very large um, up and down fluxes, very, um, very limit, very small numbers. And um, similar to what Enrique was, was discussing, a lot of different time scales. So you have to be able to capture what is going on on the one to ten year time scales, one to hundred years time scales on the land, and yet it will be important to know how much is is being transported to the bottom of the ocean. So we're dealing with with all all those. So. In a, in a cartoonish uh, representation of here, what I'm going to be discussing, the, the land model, the first thing that we need to, to include is ecosystems. How do plants actually work? How do, how do, how do they get sunlight and uptake that they feel to, right? Respiration. Then, um, then there are actually there are all sorts of biogeochemical cycles that are going to be involved with biology. Um, CO2 will be one, but then plants will also be emitting all sorts of stuff. Um, biogenic uh, volatile organic compounds, um, soil, nitrogen emissions, methane coming out of, of wetland. So if you want to have the big picture of what is going on, then you want to start looking at the representation of those cycles, and that includes having to represent above ground, below ground, all sorts of um, processes. And then one of the big drivers is obviously water. So you have to have glaciers, runoff, river routing, flooding, because flooding will make wetlands. Wetlands is where you're going to have methane emissions. So there you have to be able to take all those aspects, and then water ends up in the ocean. So you want to close the budget, and whatever comes down from precipitation has to reach the ocean. And it's a critical part of the work that we do is very simply to just ensure conservation. It's very, very it's in, it's in, it's in simple, but it's it, it's hours and hours of people's time to make sure that we actually keep track of all the source. And then it's all that under the pressure of human systems and human perturbations. So instead of having um, natural vegetation, which we might be uh, able to represent, then we have to take into account the fact that crops will be used, there will be irrigation, we will be harvesting wood, we will make cities which will change the albedo and the river runoff. And so the way the land model does that is by really having a grid cell, which tends to be um, in, in what we use for climate simulations, a one degree grid. Right? So that works always going to be great. And then we tile it. We just try, oh, okay, so we're over uh, Colorado, so there will be a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this, none of that, and a little bit of this. And then you start breaking down. Because then you can start having the representation of all the processes and all the interactions that are going to be important to drive something that ends up being tiled by groups. So not, maybe not quite the way the real world is organized, but we group them. And then this is then 
average, and this is what the information is given to the atmosphere. So the atmosphere will see the average sensible heat flux, CO2 flux that comes out. And so I could spend a lot of time uh, looking at everything that is being, being done. But these are all the processes that are now being present in the current version of CLM. A lot of work has been put on a really good representation of hydrology. Hydrology has had been a really limiting factor in having a good representation of the biology. And so you didn't have the right way um, CO2 was being taken because you didn't have something as simple as a good representation of the soil, the distribution of soil, and where the water is. So a lot of work being done trying to get not just common people, but really hydrologists and a really good hydrology model to being included in this. And this is one of the aspects of this work is that we're reaching out to more and more of the communities outside the standard climate work to get all the information that, that we can. And then all this is also, then there's this little piece here, which, which actually ends up being a, a very large driver of the way the system responds is the nitrogen deposition. Right? There, there's more than CO2 than carbon that plants care about. They have all sorts of nutrients that they, they need, nitrogen being the, the first in, in order of importance of the carbon and nitrogen. But then nitrogen, to get nitrogen, you have to get atmospheric chemistry. To get atmospheric chemistry, you have to have emissions. And then we can start doing the, those simulations and trying to have the representation of the power plants over the northeast U.S. and the pollution and what's being deposited. And that is now a nutrient that the plants can use. So I'm not going to be discussing air sea exchange of CO2 because Enrique uh, did that. The aspect of the resolution is, this is a one degree model, this is a tenth of a degree model. If you think of the strength of the core as being seen through this, this amount of kinetic energy, or just the, the structures in this, it's hard to know if the mean of this will equate the mean of this. So there is a need for high resolution. We have to push, because we have to understand how much we are missing by using this model for all uh, our projections. And we're doing the same thing on, on the atmosphere. One of the approaches that we're trying to do, trying to be smart um, once in a while at least, is, is to go with grid refinement over the regions of the interest. Because it's limited, right? Because, well, in, in actuality, you, you might be interested in looking at things everywhere. But, but what are we gaining here? And, and so, so if you do, trying to do a look at tropical cyclones, at one degree, there is no tropical cyclones. They just don't exist. There's nothing. But then if you use this grid refinement to 25 kilometers, then in the area where you care about, and again, this, that was the point that energy was trying to make, depending on the question, if your question is about tropical cyclones, then you'd better put something with high resolution, because then you start seeing tracks that are reasonably close in amplitude, direction, frequency to the real world. But then this is helping you, but if you look this and this, there's very little impact of having this high resolution over this region. So it's, it's, it's of limited use, but this is one way of, in our limited amount of resources, to go and start answering some of the questions that, that we will be interested in. So, how well did we do with all that? Well, we see someone to do what we happen. First of all, it looks like planet Earth. Right? And this is, this is, this is quite an achievement. CESM is giving you this rate of increase at Mauna Loa compared to the observation. Yet, this is a huge imbalance. Nothing that we can actually justify. This is not noise. And, and so, we had the process of trying to get better hydrology, better representation of all sorts of aspects of plants. And then, this is, this is where we started. The edge that over the 20th century, vegetation was actually a source, or 
our land was actually a source of CO2. So that explaining at least partly the divergence between the observations and the simulation. Well, actually, the best estimate was there was a sink. And so now, with the improvement uh, to biogeochemistry and the physics and the biophysics of the land model, now we're getting much closer, at least to the, the present day. Uh, so what I've been talking about is mostly this, right? Where is CO2, and then you have also the feedback temperature, and then you can have some more CO2 um, because it's, it's warming, but really what we're after is something more like this. These are all the land biogeochemical feedbacks that are actually of importance to understand the climate system, especially if you're interested at the regional scale. The global scale, maybe you can just do CO2 and you get the complete uh, temperature. But this is, this is what, what we're after. And one of my uh, projects is more on the ozone deposition because ozone, as we know since the 1950s, is actually really impacting a plant's ability to survive. And so, so under high ozone, the, the plants get really affected. And so overall, in present day, this is actually a non-negligible part of the, uh, the, the growth, growth primary productivity. And this is the impact due to ozone only. So you, you, if you're going to be pushing the model and trying to reproduce some of the observations and use it for projections, you have to start including all those processes that, that uh, I've tried to highlight. So in this um, grand tour of, of CESM that, that I tried to, to show, what I would like you to highlight is that CESM, I mean, we tried to make it a versatile tool to, to explore interactions, feedbacks in the whole um, Earth system. And, and we're really uh, struggling to, to improve uh, process representation, which is where interacting with, with people in, in the field and connecting with very, very different disciplines and expertise is where we're making progress. We're working with ecologists, we're working with people who go and, and look at fisheries. We're, we're, we have to talk to those people. We, we have to, to, to discuss very strongly with hydrologists to really understand how do we get better at the model. And so, so I think this, this is a group that would be very well, um, that it's a very good place to, to have this discussion because we're, we have to work with very different disciplines and very different skills, but in the end, be able to put all that in the climate model we can use for climate simulations. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Um, okay. First one up to the audience. As uh, Jean Francois and I were talking earlier about budgets, just so that we're clear. Um, we get about one million base funding and, and maybe three million in secondary funding, so for a total of four, and I think we're not quite sure because it's harder to tally up what CESM is, but it may be more in the order of around eight to ten million base funding and and maybe twenty million um, secondary funding. So there is the two communities are actively working. Um, to create uh, standard models that can be shared by the communities. Both are very open source. This is probably the first time that CSDMS has reached out in a uh, proactive way to CESM to start working together, and Jean Casquois has offered us to have a say in his sort of modeling world, and I think we should take advantage of that and maybe use some of the results that they're getting. So. I think there's a lot of promising things for the future in the getting these two communities work. We, we have been maybe reaching out to the other community that we work with, CIG, the cyber, cyber, cyber infrastructure and geodynamics, uh, which deals with long-time frames. Um, 
the story open to questions because there's so many that I have. I'm going to steal what I'm going to use, you know, every time. So I'm going to steal it. So I've attended many meetings between the World Climate Research Program and uh, since I sit on that board and the World Water, you know, the World Weather Research, Research Program. And I've heard these two communities, and most of the people in the climate community don't even know the World Weather Research Program exists, and it's even larger than theirs, so that's, they didn't know our community existed either. So even in the climate world, there's uh, not a lot of crosstalk. But in the, in, the, in the weather community, you know, their goal is to get to three months' predictions, you know, and they think this is almost impossible, the way they do their modeling. But that would be their goal. Well, and at this one meeting, the World Climate Research Program said, well, you know, we're, we're, our physics and our equations are based on our approach is to, that would be a very tough thing for us to do to make a three-month prediction. So I'm, I want to turn this over because we've had people at our meetings in the past that dealt, dealt with the war models, the weather research forecasting um, approach. So maybe you could spend maybe one minute on talking about climate versus weather in terms of modeling approach. All right. Yeah, because the climate is not weather. Um, so, um, well, actually, we, this is something that's been in the works over the last, last few years because of uh, um, the realization that they were very different communities, and um, we're actually trying to test our climate models in the framework of forecast. And usually, well, at first it looks terrible. Part of it is because a lot of the work that we have done has been at fairly coarse scale. But also because we've never really tried, and so we may be missing some processes um, that we think, we don't think are important on the time scales that we're interested in. But actually, so I saw the beautiful, those beautiful tracks of 25 kilometers, tropical cyclones. When I show that to the world people, they're like, uh, if you get cyclones at 25 kilometers for the wrong reason. Right, so, so, so again, we, we need, we actually need, and right now, we, we're building the system in such a way that we can bring the world physics into CESM and do tropical cyclone projections for, for the summer, the way, the way they do routinely with the weather, and then try to see what works, what doesn't work, does it break. Because in, in the end, you want to have, you want to make sure that what you're using is actually the right representation of the physics and not just some evolution from where we started in the 1970s where we're really limited. Maybe we had it a little bit, but maybe the overall approach is just not right. Hi. Um, as a hydrologist who sort of tried to work with CLM before and use components and parts from CLM uh, with my own work, uh, one of the issues I've run into is that, you know, 1.5 million lines divided by the seven odd components you showed is still a really large number. Um, and so it really comes down to that each of these components are still really big monolithic uh, things. Has there been any interest or, or uh, desire to move towards a slightly more flexible or, or sort of move away from the one model to rule them all kind of uh, viewpoint uh, within each of those pieces? Yes. Um, yeah, that's, that's a very good point, and we've heard that more than, more than, more than once. It, it, is, it is a limiting factor. Um, I think uh, some, some people just bite the bullet and spend the time to, to really get into it, but it, it is, it is a, a big barrier. Um, especially for students, and you can't just say, oh, let's start looking at the code and uh, see where your work can, can fit into it. Um, we are working into um, modularizing 
the, the land model is actually one of them that's actually making the, the most progress. At this point, the ocean is another one where, for example, the biogeochemistry is going to be a separate module, module that, that kind of sits outside the ocean model. So if you're interested in that, you can just work on it. So we're working in, in that. Um, and then at the same time, the, the limitation is, is resources because we're trying to get new releases and, and new, new things. And so we, we have just the um, carrying that way of, of old ways of doing it. So but we're moving more and more in that direction. And I think the more we hear how limiting it is to actually, in the end, improve our, our model, then the more we, we can make it happen. But it, 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 is, it is in the plans. And this CSM2, we have moved about this far in that direction. But it is moving. One of the challenges is that, that we face at the coastal land margin in evaluating climate change and sea level rise is how the floodplain is going to change into the future. And it's really interesting the work that you're doing with in being able to project the tropical slight cyclones and the tracks and get more information on how they might intensify and, and what kind of regularity we're going to see in, into the future. But do you think that what you're producing ought to be used in a design sense, that it ought to be used in informing future floodplains, or is it just more of a general information on how they might intensify? What's your opinion on you using them directly? Yeah, um, I, I would probably be because of my overly cautious nature to be on on the, on the ladder. And this is there is information, and and this this we're also trying to get statistics. What different models are, are telling you versus a single model. What is really robust that we can actually say with, without the worry that this is just a single model and that it's completely dependent on our ability to represent the, the process? Um, it, it, it really depends on the question that, that you're asking. Um, the, um, I had a workshop last summer with people doing impacts and we had people from Florida coming to have a huge issue with underground water and where it sits with respect to, uh, to seawater. And so, so I was, I was going to be more of the thought, well, there is no way that whatever we can produce would be at the issue of command that we could give information. But in, in, in that case, having the general information, is it going to get drier? Is it going to be get wetter? Was sufficient for them to actually start thinking about what would be, what could be the issues that they will be facing. So ideally, you would want to see things at the higher resolution with more representation of the details. But Enrique was extremely good at showing this does not ensure that it's going to be better. It will look better, right? When you start making those plots, you'll get all those details. Whether it's actually working better for you is completely open question, scientifically open question. We don't really know. It, gives, it might give you the false impression that it is actually working. My view has been more, let's use the limited resources that we have and go with maybe lower resolution, but then with a lot more statistics that you can actually get. And so, so then in the question that you're asking, it will really be more like, what is the likelihood of something that would be affecting a region more than something much more specific? And I think we're, that's where we're going to be for, for quite a while, because the higher resolution you go, 
the more noise you get into your system. And uh, this where uh, ensembles become even more important. So you kind of kind of stuck. You know, the more high resolution, the more computing you have to do, and yet the more ensembles you have to do. So that's that's gonna be really good. Thank you.